G'day to all my friends and family and welcome, welcome to this episode of Jim's 5am Club. I'm just going to go on a bushwalk this afternoon. It's late afternoon on Tuesday and I'm taking a new track today. And this area here is called Godden Steps and you'll probably see me stepping down these uh, these steps here which are a little bit deeper than normal but I'll just follow it all the way down and see where it leads me just so you can show it is uh, a steep decline um, but it's over here at North Mead the adjacent suburb to where I live so I'm still within the five kilometre radius of my LGA continuing to do the right thing for as long as I can um, with uh, the 70% fully vaccinated target well and truly in view now for most, most people in New South Wales. So here we are. How beautiful is this? It's like a, um, how can I describe it? It's like a uh, rainforest. It's so beautiful and lush with all the be beautiful luscious ferns. We've got these sandstone caves and um, a wonderful way to explore this beautiful suburb and surrounds close to where I live. Anyway, what I want to do today is I want to take you through a book summary and the book summary is entitled Adapt by an author named Tim Harford. I'll just wait until I get to the bottom before I start taking my eyes off the ground for fear of tumbling down these steps, <laughs> which are an awesome walk workout. What I may do is once I, um, once I get a little bit fitter, I might come up and down these steps a few times and see how it can help me work on my fitness. There we go. So I'm back down on the main track here and I've just come down, as you can see, those steps there and it's called Godden's, Godden's Steps, which take us straight up straight up the hill, up onto the road there. Right, well let's go for another walk and talk. And uh, I really appreciate you joining me on this episode. And uh, an interesting book indeed. So, what can we learn from this book summary today? The author kicks off the book summary with a uh, nice little quote where uh, he says that no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Um, what, what matters is how quickly the, lead, the leaders are able to adapt. And I guess we learn this in our lives that uh, it's all about being flexible. It's all about being able to uh, adapt to our surroundings uh, because things are changing all the time and what worked yesterday for, uh, for us may no longer work tomorrow and hence why the author here says that no plan survives first, content, for first contact with the enemy and we need to keep on changing and um, modifying our approaches in order to um, maximise our outcome and our ability to survive. As you can see up there, there are all these very, very tall, beautiful rock faces, which would be lovely to abseil down. Um, so all of the houses up there are built on a very, very solid foundation indeed. So um, what else can we learn from this book? What the author also says is that growth implies an ongoing process of trial and error. 
I like I like the way the author says it's an ongoing process. It's a da- dance of back and forward of trial and error and gradual maturity as we learn more about ourselves but also about the world around us and we um, are able to then adjust the way we do things to achieve the outcomes that we desire. So we need to be constantly changing, constantly morphing, constantly um, becoming chameleons, able to adapt, to fit in, to work around. And we've seen that in political life. Last week we had Gladys Berejiklian as our Premier, and now we have uh, Perrottet as our uh, as our Premier in a uh, in a heartbeat. Change happened in a heartbeat. But the good news is, is that whilst Gladys was a brilliant Premier who uh, worked tirelessly for her um, for her for her for her, um, for her people and her constituents, and for all people indeed, so too um, will the new Premier and his, uh, his team be able to contribute to our, um, our wealth, our commonwealth for this beautiful state. So we need to understand and appreciate and embrace the notion that uh, life is all about Continuous, tra- um, continuous struggle and continuous growth and development where we're morphing, we're changing our approach in order to um, fine-tune our, um, our activities to meet the various challenges which come along the way. So the author reminds us here that the key to growth is to accept failure and hence why the author mentioned trial and error trial and error so the key to growth is to accept failure and to learn from it and that's what trial and error is all about it's about trying things and um, let's go down here and have a look where this leads us this may lead to another trail I won't do it today but I I might do it another time because as the author tells us, and as we've learnt many times before, that nobody, but nobody, has ever been to the future. Nobody has been to tomorrow. Um, and most people, and all people, all we can do is just predict what's going to happen and where we're going and where we're heading. So what the author here is saying is that because nobody can predict the future doesn't mean that we can't shape it. Doesn't mean that we can't imagine it and try and predict it. So we need to continue to try try and use different approaches and if they work, they work. If they don't work, come again, try again, I guess is the, uh, is the lesson. Just like coming down here I'm just trying different tracks different trails and seeing where they lead us and as I said I won't cross over here today but what I will do is I'll come back another time and see where that trail there leads and once I do my little discovery I'll uh, then have yet another uh, option available to me next time I come bushwalking to, uh, to take me in a different direction and hopefully will loop me around and bring me back f- from a different angle. So uh, the first formal point to come from this book, from this author, is where uh, the author says that um, expectation beats disappointment when forecasts go wrong. Because nobody's been to the future, as the author mentions, um, 
Um, it's important to try and shape the future, try and perceive the future. But uh, the author here says something else which is really, really powerful, is that people who are able to predict the future aren't necessarily brilliant. It just means that um, they're able to fluke it. Because we live in a world where things, most things, are unpredictable because there are just so many variables outside of our control, outside of our vision, um, unable for us to be able to perceive, then things just happen. And even experts get most things wrong. In fact, if you're an expert, you're, you've got more chances of getting things wrong because uh, you just think that you know what you're talking about and you may not um, be able to see the things that are just around the corner. So as the author here says, a lot of predictions are just lucky guesses. Lucky guesses, um, and most of these predictions and lucky guesses should not be treated as facts because uh, it's more likely to get it wrong, even if you're an expert. So um, it's something to keep in mind because we sometimes tend to um, trust experts a lot more than, than what we need to trust them. Now, fair enough, they understand things to a certain extent and to a certain level. But the author here is saying that because, no, because nobody has been to the future, um, nothing is guaranteed. So people um, give their opinion, and that opinion could be an um, educated opinion based on experience, but it's not the truth. The opinion, the pre a prediction, is not the truth. Um, and you see it. Like, you know, over the weekend we had the NRL Grand Final between Penrith and South Sydney. And there were so many experts who were convinced that South Sydney were going to defeat Penrith. And yet, Penrith won. You know, are the experts wrong? Did something happen? Were they cheated? No. It just is, you know, a prediction, an opinion based on, I guess, emotion, experience. But in a competition, when two teams are trying their hardest and there's a fixed amount of time to determine an outcome, then things happen. And a lot of those things that happen, as I said, are outside of people's control and not everybody can, um, can get it right, even if they're an expert. So the bottom line from this author is a realization that failure is a natural part of growth. So we need to expect in our, in our lives to fail many times before we enjoy success. I remember uh, a couple of months ago watching a documentary on television and hearing David Attenborough um, commenting on uh, an outcome. It was a typical sort of, uh, um, I think, lioness or a pack of lionesses but it was one lioness who was chasing, chasing a, a wildebeest and um, grabbed it, wrestled it to the ground and uh, killed it. I go, wow, you know, how, how, uh, how interesting is what we see in nature. But it was uh, David Attenborough who put into perspective and he said, you see these situations or you see these outcomes but what most people don't understand is that a lioness, a jaguar, a, a tiger, you name it, 
whatever it is, anybody who's who needs to depend on hunting to uh, to survive, they don't win every time. On average, according to uh, David Attenborough, he said that uh, a hunt in most cases will end in a failure and it's only one out of ten that will be successful and that's why in times of drought or in times of um, severe heat or lack lack of uh, food around and about that uh, lions or tigers or jaguars or you name it whenever they chase chase down their prey to uh, to catch them every time they miss out is uh, one chance where they could actually perish because they use up so much energy and so much um, you know so many calories in the chase that uh, if they're not eating and getting the nutrition to their body and the water then there could be a chance that every time they miss out on a kill and on a feed, they're one step closer to death. So in nature, not every hunt, not every attempt um, creates a, a win or an outcome. So the next point in this book here is where the author talks about, about what we need to do in, in order to adapt and it means we need to take chances we need to have a crack we need to have a go but sometimes or in many cases people are surrounded by bureaucracy and authority which hold back um, and um, I guess throttle down on risk-taking and innovation I remember, I don't know where, where it was, but I recall reading a book once where somebody said, or I think it was at IBM, when somebody said that if you ask people for permission, whatever you're doing, they said, if you ask for permission, then the answer is usually going to be no. So what you need to do if you're a leader is you need to assume you need to assume that you have the authority you you need to assume that you have permission to get things done because if you ask for permission the answer will most probably be no and then if you've asked the question then obviously you can't continue doing what you're doing because you're then you're breaking the rules so it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission is the point and um, I guess the message here for young people is don't go through life looking to the person next to you and seeing what they're doing or asking permission to do what you have to do each person each and every one of us has a responsibility and an accountability to achieve our dreams and to get our job done. Um, because nobody has been to the future, and we've talked about that before, because nobody's been to the future, sometimes there's no value in looking to your big brother, looking, looking to your big sister, looking to your parent, looking to your work peer to see what they're doing or to ask them what, what you should do because they may not be in the best position to advise you on you doing something in order to achieve what you're trying to achieve and what's going to make you fulfilled in your life. So, um, we need to understand that when you ask permission, usually the people who, are, who you're asking 
are worried and they're always going to say no don't do what you're doing for fear of you doing something and getting injured and them feeling as if they're res they're responsible for your endangerment or your dissatisfaction just getting, getting my breath now here we go it's a nice little incline so um, there's a big lesson here as well for organizations I remember back in the 80s when I was working for IBM there was a lot of discussion a lot of talk on decentralization and um, decentralized decision making decentralized operations empowerment of the workforce and I remember then them back then saying that the best decisions are always made by the people who are closest to the, to the problem. Sometimes by the time you send a request for help to management or you call the, try and call the cavalry in for assistance, it could be too late. Sometimes, as the author suggests, is that you just got to make a decision and stick by it, and uh, and not waste valuable time by going backward and forward to a centralised decision-making body uh, because you miss or you can miss the critical opportunity to make a difference and to make a decision that will uh, uh, benefit you, the organisation, the client and everybody around. So uh, decentralised. And as we have these days, we've got decentralised computing. We've got cloud computing. We've got... Um, people now working from home so that you no longer need to be located in the same place with everybody else but you can actually be in contact with others 24 7 via mobile devices so uh, I guess these days more than any any other time we've got the communication tools and the productivity tools to enable us to work um, independently to make decisions and also to communicate quickly and effectively uh, with our team members and uh, get get things done and documented um, instantaneously so we're in a better place in a better place now than what we've ever been in, uh, in the past check out these black boys there are black boys everywhere beautiful I actually learned today that the dam here at North Rocks that we're going to see in front of us shortly um, was built so it can stem the flow in floods stem the flow of water to protect Parramatta and all the areas downstream from getting flooded. So whilst when I saw it, I thought it was a, um, a failed project or a waste of time, I was assured today by another walker that uh, when it does rain and it pelts down, that the, uh, this dam here actually holds off and keeps back the water and only allows a small amount of water to get through in a controlled fashion. So uh, the last point on this book here, in this book, and I'll just go down to the dam, the last point to come from this author is how do we initiate, how do we foster, and how do we enable 
um, decision making um, and innovation amongst team and people. And he said that uh, there are two things that we need to do and gifting prizes or, or offering award, rewards and awards can boost innovation and boost critical thinking. So what you're doing is by, by gifting prizes and providing awards and rewards, then you're basically telling people that it's okay to, to do what they do. And here we have the dam from, from up, up top. And as you can see, it's a, a huge concrete structure. Um, because innovation, according to the author, relies heavily on creativity and critical thinking. And these two things that we mentioned are heavily stifled by bureaucracy and centralization. So how do you reward people? How do you make them want to make a contribution? The author here is, says that you can patent, patent ideas and within an organization, within the family, you allow people to take risks and then they are able to use the monopoly of the idea and be recognized for the ones who brought that to the attention and to the, um, I guess, to the productized for the rest of the group. The other thing is goal-oriented prizes, such as prize money, grants, awards, titles. All of those things, according to the author, work together to create an environment and a culture that nurtures and facilitates innovation and adaptation. So here we go. This is the dam here at North Rocks. And I'm way up high now, and I'll just take the road, take the path down to the bottom. As I say, I haven't taken this path down before, so it's the first time I'm doing it. But we'll, we'll see where it leads us. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Jim's 5am Club, where we went through and learnt a little bit from this book called Adapt by Tim Harford. I really enjoyed delivering this book summary, so... Thank you once again for being patient and vicariously joining me on this bushwalk. We're so lucky to live here in Sydney and to be surrounded by parklands, by bush, where we can, I don't know, get away from home and uh, within a few kilometres have access to... Uh, to these paths, to these roads, to this, um, these lungs, to this experience. So um, we'll come again at a different time with a different message, a message of empowerment, which can um, teach us, hopefully, something new, where we can be partners in each other's growth and development and um, incorporate something new into the inventory of knowledge that we have because after all learning is attaching the unknown to the known so the more you learn the more you know the more you're capable of knowing yes us take care and we'll chat again bye for now